friends, it's m u n i c o r n and today I'm bringing you my July reading wrap up. I read 10 books in July, including two classics, one historical fiction, four mystery novels, and three nonfiction s dealing with a variety of topics. I'm very happy about the books that I read in July because not only I enjoyed most of them, but I was also able to read、uh, different topics that suits my different k i n d of curiosities. So, without further ado, let's talk about the books in genres. First of all, the classics. July is Jane Austen July. It is an event that I try to participate every year, but frankly, I failed most of the time. But this year, I was so happy that I finally read the group book and was able to participate in the conversations. And the group book that I read is Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. The story centered around Catherine Morland, who grew up in a relatively large family with a lot of siblings. So, because of that, she was able to grow up freely without a lot of attention from her parents. And also because of that, she didn't learn a lot of the social norms of how to navigate the social situations in the society. So, when it came to her teenage years, she was invited to visit the city of Bath with her family friends. And it is in Bath where she was put into the center of a lot of dramas and dealing with a lot of social situations that she didn't encounter before. This book was really fun to read, but also put me at ease、uh, a lot of times in a good way because I am the kind of person when it comes to big. Social gatherings, I kind of want everybody to feel comfortable. Not a people pleaser per se, because sometimes I just don't care and I just do whatever I want. But in general, I care and worry about other people's feelings. And this book, especially the first part, has a lot of social engagement where none of the people are comfortable, which makes me super on edge. And reading it with a modern lens, I found it's very interesting that I can identify a lot of the psychological things that happen in this book. For example, Love bombing, gaslighting, and just a lot of manipulations. And what's more interesting is I feel like Jane Austen was also able to identify and also critique those things. She wrote it in such a funny and satire tone, which I feel connected throughout the whole book. However, the second part of the book is less engaging compared to the first part. Not only the scenery changed from a very vibrant city where a lot of activities are happening to a single place, the protagonist, Catherine. Changed from a participator of events to a observer. So I was a little bit detached in the second half, but I enjoyed the whole story nonetheless. The next classic, maybe you're already tired of hearing me talking about it, but I read Les m i s e r a b l e s by Victor Hugo. I read this every month's library edition and it was translated by Charles E. Wilbur. This is a hardcore classic which has been adapted into so many formats over the years, and this time I read it. Specifically, because of the musical was touring to San Francisco, so I wanted to read it before I went to see the musical. This book mostly centered around a man called Jean Valjean who endorsed a 19 y e a r s unjust imprisonment. And upon his release, he was pursued by his lifelong rival Javar. And when we follow Jean Valjean, we encounter different characters such as Fantine, Cosette, and、uh, Marius. And all of that painted a poignant and complex picture. Of the aftermath of the French Revolution. Now, of course, the book focuses on portraying the life of the impoverished people and how they are facing exploitation day to day. I loved reading this book so much. Hugo is a master in storytelling and character development. And in my opinion, this book has the most perfect villain in the history of literature, which is Javard. And also, I just hated the person called Marius so much. If you have watched like other adaptations, Of this book, maybe you don't dislike him as much, but in this book, he is so annoying. Just like,、mm. however, Hugo is also a very ambitious writer, and he also likes to write about nonfiction, such as the French history, and also some other things, such as the urban planning of the city of Paris. So sometimes the nonfiction part can go on so long, which I feel like is almost like two books a fiction and a nonfiction two in one. However, that is not saying that I did not like this part. I just wish that I have more background knowledge going into those nonfiction parts. But I learned a lot from those parts, and I feel like I actually was able to appreciate this book more because how 
ambitious that he wrote. Just like how Mario's is more annoying in this book, this book itself is more darker and cruel than its stage adaptations, and I actually love it because of that. Because I feel like the characters are more coherent in the story, and a lot of the plot development makes more sense because how darker it is. It is such an emotional investment. The last. 50 pages of this book, I was just lying down on the floor and crying non-stop. I have so much to say about this book, so I think I'll make some like other videos about it, but just wanted to wrap it up in this video saying that I read it. I loved it so much. Now let's move on to historical fiction. The historical fiction I read this month is Lessons in Chemistry by Barney Garmus. This is a book that I've seen everywhere, so I borrowed the audiobook from the library. The story was set in the 1960s in the United States. States and centered around a woman called Elizabeth Dodd, who is a brilliant scientist, but she was also belittled and ignored her entire career life just because she's a woman. And after some turns of events, she started to host a cooking show on TV called Supper at Six. I'm actually very confused about the marketing choices of this book because to me, the story of Elizabeth Dodd and also the people around her reflect all the hardships that women need to face in the 60s and Moreover, some of the things that she experienced, we are still discussing and experiencing today. So it is a very heart-wrenching book for me to read, and I even cried once in reading this book. Frankly, I cry a lot, but still. However, from the marketing and the cover art, we have this impression that this book is a fun and uh, light summer read, which I just cannot agree with. Especially considering Elizabeth thought is belittled in her entire life, I just feel like the marketing kind Kind of did the same to her, which is unfair. However, I do have some reviewer friends who said that they laughed out loud when reading this book, so maybe I. I'm just not a fun person. <laughs> but despite the hardness that Elizabeth Dodd went through, I have to say that this book does have a very optimistic undertone, which make it somewhat unrealistic. Maybe that's also the reason about the marketing choices. Personally, I enjoyed a lot about the characters and also the plot development that I am willing to bypass the unrealisticness of the story and give it a five star, but it also may become some other reader's concern. I have four minutes mystery novels to talk about because after I read Les Mis, my brain died a little bit and needs relaxing, so naturally I went to binge my favorite genre, which is mystery. Two of the books are written by Agatha Christie that I read in one day. The first is the Secret Adversary by Agatha Christie. This is the first book of the Tommy and Tavin series which I have read now from, and this is actually a very different book from her other novels as well, because different from her other detectives, it was very established before the story gets started. Uh, Tommy and Tavin, they are two young people who didn't really know what to do with their life, so one day they just decided to advertise themselves on the newspaper saying that they are willing to do anything if they get paid. So naturally, they they get involved in some huge international scandals which related to the First World War and they just started a adventure. So I think instead of saying that this is a murder mystery of Agatha Christie's, this is actually a um, adventure stories with mystery elements in it. And also we're following two very different people and they each have their own unique storylines and uh, there are some captivating twists in the story and because they are amateurs, they make a lot of mistakes that make you very very nervous at times. I enjoy this book a lot. I think it's a very fun read. It's a change of taste from other Agatha Christie stories, and I can't wait to read more from the series. They only have like five books in total, I think, which is not hard for me to read at all. The next book I read is from the Poro series, and it is Peril at End House. This is a book talking about one day Poro is sitting in a hotel yard going on vacation with his friends Hastings, and he met a young woman who is rushed in into something, but he found a bullet hole in the woman's hat. So the woman told him that she had three brushes with death and how lucky she was. However, Pura says that the woman's life is in danger because someone is out there and apparently wanted to take her out. So he decided to intervene and uh, protect this woman. This book is very fun to read, and as usual, I didn't see what's coming, although all the clues are in front of my eyes. Uh, but frankly, I didn't really active a lot of my brains when reading. Agatha Christie anymore, so uh, I just want to go in for relaxing and enjoyment, and this book did just that for me. After Christie, I read Age of 
Japanese detective collection that translated into Chinese, which is Ben Zhen Sha Ren Shi Jian. The title story is um, Hong Jin Sazu Jin Jiken, and it was translated into English as the Hong Jin Murders. However, this book in Chinese is a collection of three different stories, which have two more stories compared to the English translation. My copy was translated into Chinese by Yu Zhuang. The author Yukumi Tsuzaichi is one of the most iconic Japanese mystery writers in the post World War II Japan, and this book features one of his most popular detectives called Kendaichi. The title story, which is also the story in English, is talking about a tragic case that happened in a village in Japan. A very respected local family in the village was having a wedding for their son. And the night after the ceremony, people heard tragic screaming from the newlywed couple and some weird eerie music from their room. After that, people found out that the bride and the groom was brutally killed in their room and even cut into pieces. No trace was left except a bloody samurai sword in the snow. People are suspected a very sinister man who came to the village earlier and uh, strangely asking around. This story, along with the two other stories that I read, immerse us in the time where Japan has started to accepting some Western values and cultures while also holding on some traditional ones that they valued a lot. For that reason, the atmosphere is very gruesome and have the kind of bleakness that I like from Japanese mysteries. And also, you can tell a lot of the influence of the Western mis murder mysteries in this book because the author was constantly talking about the western murder mystery that he read. He had the role of a writer in the stories, uh, which means that he actually heard the stories like the murder cases and he write about how he write them down. <laughs> so that's why he was able to talking about a lot of like western murder mysteries, which I found very interesting. But also because it is a time where all the traditional and uh, modern ideas are get into conflict, I feel like the motives in the stories are a little bit repetitive for me to read all three of the stories in one go. However, I still enjoy this book and I recommend you to check out The Hong Jin Murders if you haven't. The last mystery that I read is Whose Bodies by Dorothy L. Sayers. This is me attempting to read more from the golden age of murder mysteries, which is 1920s and 1930s. And this is the first book of the Lord Peter Wimsey series. So a friend of Lord Peter Wimsey's mom called Thiffs uh, called his mom one day because he found out a body sitting in his bathtub in London uh, wearing nothing but a glasses. And they have no idea who this dead man is and Lord Peter Wimsey decided to investigate because he is amused by this case. The setting of this book reminded me of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie, but different from that book where nobody was actually suspecting the owner of the house, the police in this book turned down the uh, person called Thibs immediately, but Lord Peter Wimsey has some different ideas. And you can tell that I'm struggling to say Lord Peter Wimsey every time because this is actually the part where I found it's uh, giving me a lot of troubles in this book because I am very not familiar with the British noble titles and I have to figure out what does Lord or Duchess or all of that things meant when I was reading this book because I didn't go in expecting that I was reading a historical fiction. <laughs> but I feel like if you are more familiar with the system than me, you will be enjoy this book more. Maybe I should really study that because I do plan to continue reading more books from this series. And now let's move on to the non-fictions that I read this month. I read some thought-provoking non-fictions which I'm really happy about. The first book I read is Real Queer America LGBT Stories from Red States by Samantha Allen. This book was recommended to me by Alex from the channel Alex Black Reads, which I'll link her channel down below. She has amazing reading taste, and I just really love the fact that we can have some great recommendations back and forth that we both enjoy. And this book was not an exception. Samantha Allen traveled through America after the 2016 election and interviewing the queer communities in some of the deep red states and reflecting and recollecting her personal memories and also thinking about the work that have 
been done and to be done. California, especially San Francisco, which is where I live and where I love, got bashed so hard in this book for its work culture and the lack of supportive communities. By supportive here, I don't mean that uh, inclusiveness. I mean that the day-to-day -day warm hugs from your neighbors and your friends. Before moving to California, I also lived in Texas for five years. So I have my like first-hand comparison about how the different styles of communities that in uh, states like Texas or states like California. So for that reason, I actually recommend this book to the people who lives in uh, states like California, like me. Because I feel like this book can be a portal for us to see uh, what traits in the community that people decided to stay in red states despite the smaller community they have, uh, what traits they value more in a community and to see that there's still work to be done in a lot of places, including some very vibrant places like San Francisco. With that being said, I also saw some critique of this book saying that it kind of romanizing the lives in red states for queer communities and also um, it's overly optimistic. I feel like I can also see that in this book too but I also feel like maybe that's because um, Samantha's love for the red states it is a place where she is familiar with and she grew up with. This is a memoir nonetheless. But I also feel like the optimistic tone can come from the act of actions because a lot of people she interviewed including herself they decided to stay in those places because they wanted to make changes and they did take action which is actually hard to not be optimistic if you see progress over the years and i think that's something that uh, she's doing extraordinary personally i enjoyed reading this book and i learned so much from it so i highly highly recommend it next i read a book called politics is for power how to move beyond political hobby Take Action and Make Real Change by Eden D. Hirsch. I randomly listened to an episode of this book of this author talking about the concept called political hobbyism years ago when the book was published and it since intrigued me and I picked up this book last month. This book was particularly very uh, hard for me to read because I fit into the definition of political hobbyist perfectly. So the author defines political hobbyists as people who follow the news intensively and express their outrage online from time to time and he argued that political hobbyists do that as a form of entertainment and a expression of self-identity. And I feel like embarrassed after saying that because this book is really calling out people like me and talking about how political hobbyists sometimes they are not only unhelpful but also um, do harms in some way because political hobbyists kind of are driven by their excitement and outrage and the new media technologies and laws they sense the emotional values of political hobbyists and they reward the politicians who cater to uh, the emotional outrages of political hobbyists. So needless to say that I was very uncomfortable the entire time reading this book and my thoughts and reactions like bounced between it isn't really that bad and also something like oh, maybe it is problematic and how should I do about it? Luckily and unluckily, the author suggested some doable actions for political hobbyists and how to move beyond the entertainment value of following all the politics and really take actions on the issues that are around us. And this is actually the part where I'm mostly unsatisfied because the author emphasis on the value of volunteering and giving time, providing time to the communities a lot, which I agree. But I also feel like the author failed to recognize the fact that having time and energy to volunteer in the community is a privilege. One of the point he's making is that a lot of political hobbyists, they have maybe one hour or more to follow the news every day and they can actually take this hour to do some community work in the community for lack of a better word. But I just feel like it's very different if you have a collective 
a uh, one hour every day to follow the news compares to you have like a whole hour going out to do community work because for most of the people when we consume news we don't sit there and consume news for like an hour we do it in different breaks in our busy life and we don't really have like the entire hour to you know go out of the door and if you live in the a lot of states that you need to drive to a place to do the volunteering work and also drive back the commute alone can easily be like half an hour and take a lot of energy to manage a lot of busy people who goes to work and have family responsibilities don't really have the privilege to have a set hour every day to do uh, volunteer work not to mention the amount of energy it takes which is hard to manage for a lot of people i know that this book argued that you can start with something small and you don't really need to uh, do one hour of volunteer work obviously like every day but i wish the author writes more about small doable collective actions in this book instead of writing uh, chapters and chapters about volunteering which is kind of hard for a lot of people to follow up. But with that being said, I still feel like this book is very informative and thought-provoking because I feel like political hobbyist and hobbyism is something that we still need to reflect on if we are doing only doing political as a hobby or if we are really taking actions to improve the process that to where like we want to be. The last book in this wrap up is a lovely graphic memoir and it is How to Be Aged, A Memoir of Growing Up Asexual by Rebecca Burgess. This is a book that I recommended by Shannon from That's So Paul after we read Ace by Angela Chen together last year. I placed a hold in the library since then and I finally got it. This is a lovely story about how Rebecca Burgess grew up asexuality and she needs to learn about herself and adapted this world which is very sexual obsessed and learn how to be aged in the society. I especially love the part where she talks about how to be in a relationship as asexual and also what asexuality plays the role in a long-term healthy relationship. This book is also very personal because it's not only talking about AIDS, but Rebecca Burgess suffers from other mental health issues such as OCD and she talks about that candidly and both of the things that shaped how she viewed the world and shaped her personality which I enjoyed reading about. I like the extra content in the end of each chapter talking about the diversity in a spectrum and I think this book is very helpful for younger people who is growing up asexuality and find themselves not fitting into the sexual obsessed culture that much and also for people who like to learn about what it's like to growing up ace. And that is all the book that I read in July. I hope you enjoyed this video and please let me know any of your thoughts about the books that I mentioned and what books have you read in July and don't forget to say hi in the comment section down below. Thumbs up to this video if you liked it. I hope you happy reading, stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you in my next bookish video. Bye!